like to welcome uh, Andreas Hornig then up to the uh, podium to present the paper on the demonstrator and operation satellite mission to Earth on migration point and on fourth communication relay provision as a service. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, um, we have check. I'm Andreas Hanek, and I'm really glad to be here presenting my talk about the um, long title you gave. It is my final diploma thesis study, and it was done at the Institute of Space System and at the University of Stuttgart with the strong support of all three systems in Bremen. And the paper is the overall summary of this uh, research I did. And I will present you today the motivation of work, the mission in general, and the mission orbit, and concentrating on the most important subsystems that are the propulsion system, because you want to go there, the communication, because it's for the surface, the environmental sensors, because it hasn't been done by now, and the conclusion and perspective. So, first of all, past and present uh, lunar missions already rely on, just rely on um, Carry a direct to earth communication or relay that carrying or accompanying or orbiting systems, and uh, this really restricts the landing zone on the lunar near side and is uh, also result in blackout phases for orbiters and limited operation in time for decaying orbits that have been the result of it. And uh, to get rid of these negative effects, there have been proposed some long-term communication infrastructures like the Hummingbird or even placing one on the Halo orbit at L2. Both are on the L2 and both have been proposed in the late 60s, but they haven't been done yet. And so there's still something to do in this respect. There is some kind of network with the Mars Exploration Joint Initiative started in 2009. With MRO and it's ongoing, so you can use this existing networks for all kinds of mass exploration methods. And there are thoughts about doing this also for lunar exploration, so there is a big need for this yeah. for the uh, future exploration of lunar uh, surface and even beyond. And so that's now my point. I did uh, some concept study for this, it's a phase zero, almost phase eight report of this Typhoon mission, and it is a communication relay service between the Earth and the Moon. We are via the Earth Moon Liberation Point, EML4. It's a long-term infrastructure for different Moon missions on lunar surface, orbit, and the EML1 and 2 points, so here's the service aspect. And the mission is divided in two missions. First of all, that's the main point, is a demonstrator satellite, TMO0, that is for qualification of the later ongoing operational mission and the, what I said about, the operational satellite team or one which provides the long-term communication service at MVN. And this shall bring an opening of new, this shall bring new scientific and marketing opportunities. Not marketing, market opportunities, so far right. Okay, what's so special about EML4 for this kind? It's, it has an opportunity to have the test for this possibility of a relative fixed position with respect to lunar surface and it's long term stable so it's a nice place for placing the satellite for a long term communication system and what you get is for lunar mission that with um, the permanent axis from this is the coverage on, on the upper, upper map um, you get permanent access to this area and this already includes 10 out of 13 high, high priority landing sites that have been um, studied with the ESA, the NASA ESA studies and these are mainly points for uh, interest about the geological aspects, astronomy mission and even manned exploration later on and it also covers an exclusive zone leaving this with respect to other relay satellites like when you place one on the EML2 and if you are considering the space network there is a gap where both of them are not really good in covering so this is only covered by a satellite from EML4 so this is the main purpose and the main um, um, turning point here and the complete study has been done according to the operational mission for TMI1 so everything is identified for and um, designed for the TMI1 and Critical points have been identified for the transfer injection to the EML4 orbit because this hasn't been done before. Only Hyten passed through it, did some measurement, but they didn't stay there, they didn't inject it to it. And uh, attitude and orbital control hasn't been done yet for this point. 
only for the other sign Earth elevation points and others. And the EML4 environment is not completely understood yet, so there is a basic need for getting to know what will happen through long time infrastructure there. And of course, it's a communication relay satellite. The performance has to be guaranteed from this for at least 10 years. And derived from this, everything has to be qualified for the demonstrator mission because you want to have a risk redu reduction and a cost reduction, and um, of course the qualification. So you get rid of everything that you don't, don't need, reducing the complexity, complexity. So you see here, the TML1 has two dishes and the communication system, and on the TML0 it's just one because we just want to have this qualified, and then you can scale it up there. Um, as I said, this hasn't been done before, so the user requirements have been identified in my research. These are mainly done in three aspects. It's a communication uh, availability, so a permanent access um, the users want to have, and by a long time, we are 10 years, so it even includes some lunar bases approaches later on, because I don't know uh, how long lunar bases will take to build there, but this mission is being designed for this. And uh, the communication performance, it's about 400 MBits. And this is four times the current um, data rate of ISS, so we can even use and transfer it to lunar bases or other space stations. And 400 MBits is also a recommendation by ITU for EML4, <coughs> EML uh, missions in general. And of course, standard, standardized universal access, like um, this has already been done with BN EDRS or International uh, Lunar Network. And derived from this mission requirements have been set up like it should, have, uh, it should be a relay service and it should mainly be built by commercially out of the shelf products to keep the cost down. The orbit position has been guaranteed to stay there under the, con under the conditions you want to have. So NOCS is an important thing and the communication in general it is RF and laser communication. This is mainly important like this, like the one presenter already, uh, already told us about that for future mission it will be really important. And both aspects are um, also for standardized, standardized universal access um, because EGRS is always using, um, also using this. Um, now, how do we get there? In my study, I selected the weak stability boundary transfer for the demonstrator at least to keep costs down. Okay, it will take a little bit longer, but with 10 days additionally, I think um, the, the, the maximizing of payload is an important point over here. So the least stability for boundary transfer has been selected. And the sequence is as following. Ah, it's working. The sequence is starting from a um, standard UTO provided by the launcher. The apple axis is rises, rise by uh, six times. So to keep gravity uh, drags low, um, as low as possible. At the apple axis, the carry axis is rise. And additionally, plane change is done, and the mid cost correction is um, proceeded to um, yeah, to correct the some kind of slow errors. And when we get to the target injection, the apple axis is lowered again, and, and additionally, plane correction is done because of the third body effects happening over this 19 days of transfer. Oh, not all the pressure from me now. <laughs> Okay, now we are there, and now it's, it's getting complicated, so I took um, other studies by Walt Falter and Vaughan for the um, EML4 target orbit. There's a best and worst case, annual data V I selected. Um, I, this couldn't be done with the scope of my work, this isn't doctorate, so I'm just a diplomatist guy. And, but I could simulate the effects they had predicted, or uh, they say, okay, and pulsating extraction and expansion of the target orbit around the EML4 is considered, and I could at least um, simulate this. So I took their data Vs for the further concept. An end of life orbit has to be done because it's required for geo communication satellites. And in this case, there have been several options, but my disposal is on the moon because moon is only category one. And as long as you don't hit the lunar Apollo mission heritage sites, it should be doable. Okay. For the propulsion system, I selected a VPRO propulsion system with one MMH. It's pressure regulated to keep it working the 10, day, 10 years. The oxidizer and fluid ratio is selected to have equal tank sizes, as I come to this later. And the motor candidate and subset candidates are from ELDS. 
with 500 newtons and 22 newtons to have the ability for redundancy. The both using the same propellant, if one fails, at least when the main motor fails, you can you could do it with AOCS. It takes longer, but the mission is not over at this point. So that's the reason why. Um, the QB prop that I selected has had been compared with the dual mode from another company, uh, company's motors and uh, thrusters, but um, the equal tank sizing and other aspects have been uh, led to less propellant and tank masses, so maximizing the payload. For this was the decision to take the LES thrusters and, of course, of European heritage. And so I don't run into any ITO, ITO restriction because I'm from, I'm from Germany. Mm -hmm. um, from the um, communication payload side, it's K band, it's 25.5 gigahertz around, 100 MBits per channel, and two channels with polar polarization. It's based on a TSA TTRA system because, from my study, it was really important to have an adaptive, flexible data rate and frequency selection somehow because I want to serve a huge range of customers and they are ranging from 100 kilobits to 400 MBits. So, at least um, this. See that system should work for adapting the, the size of the data rate. And uh, by selecting K-band and the channel polarization, it's also ADRS compatible. And so we can even integrate this into the network or at least use the same commercial um, products for the, um, uh, for the payload. For the later communication, it's like the ADRS, it's still 10, uh, 1064 uh, nanometer range. It's a commercial off-the-shelf product, so this is only 22 MBs because I want to took it, take it, place it on my satellite, and then have the qualification from um, this thing because it hasn't been flown on EIS yet. It's qualified but not there. And uh, this is another qualification test for the TMA-1, for the operational mission. Then there is a full power and perhaps um, 1.8 giga, 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 gigabits of transfer, perhaps. But this is another aspect I come to it later. And the standard TTN TTNC system in x -band, not interfering with anything on the moon because the astronomy uh, persons don't want to have me interrupting on the far side of the moon while they're doing astronomy. Um, for the TMR Zero mission, it's only the Earth thing that is active because I can do the qualification of the data rates only with Earth. So I don't need anything else, like an accompanying lunar, um, lunar mission on the moon side. But I want to have a determination of target pointing. This is done via optical sensors and the attitude and control. So just um, qualifying that I am good enough to hitting all the uh, hitting all the targets on the moon. The later uh, TMO one will have both sides, both things. And for the links, um, this is only a shortened shortened uh, link budget. Um, um, it was designed to have at least a system margin of more than 3 dB to have at least um, um, this kind of dB and it also includes a rain margin of 10 to have 99.99% of availability during the service. So um, this has been the reason why these boxes are marked. Furthermore, I already told that um, the EML4 region is not very well understood. There is a dispute if there is a Cordilesky cloud. It's a small, a small dust cloud. It should be there, but nobody had really proof of it. So this is the reason why there are dust detectors on board for small particles with small masses and small velocities and a sensor for cosmic particles that have higher velocities and higher impact uh, energy so to distinguish whether or not it's coming from the Cordilesky cloud or somewhere else. This is the aspect for having a research about the degradation of solar power generator to be sure that 10 years of, oper of, of, of operational time is doable with um, the later TMA-1 mission. Um, everybody who is interested in numbers, to give you um, some overview, the launch mass of the satellite will be about two tons, so it's quite a um, big demonstrator, quite a small demonstrator, a uh, big demonstrator, but a small communication satellite, and the power is about 1.2 uh, kilowatts. So the cost, cost budget is about 230 million euros. It's um, considered on basis on existing geo communication satellites and on another EURS-C satellite. And uh, it 
for this, it's just a TMI zero uh, demonstrator emission, but with the learning curve, this is also be considered for the later for the operation emission. The development um, relies on standard and cost, cost uh, components. The technology, technology development initiatives have been identified, like how high power um, LEDs for the uh, high power laser emitters for the laser communication terminals and it's even possible to have it as an alternative platform like um, the GEO from OHP. So this mission should be feasible. Okay, now to the service character, which person or which user shall this communication satellite serve? That's a big issue in my, in my opinion. That's the reason why the, the demonstrator mission is so important because it can at least qualify without a partnering mission and telling you it is possible, and with one K band and laser, it can even serve as an EDI satellite, as a backup satellite, so it's not completely useless. But without a mission after 2017, there is no, at least um, as far as I know, there is no, there is only one planned mission, and it's not even clear if it will fly or not. And uh, afterwards, it will only be private ones, or like the big one over there, 2015, is. The big spark is Google Lunar X Prize, and nobody knows if they will keep this point over here. So not be really afraid by the spike and big uh, spikes. So um, it is really difficult to tell the current users for this. But at least the demonstrator should be safe, and there is at least some uh, possibility for having it at the EDRS satellite. And the, the quickest and the earliest point for the deployment of the operational satellite is after 2025. So considering all the um, technology initiatives that has been done, like the waiting for the CITRA system to be ready in 2016 and other later communication issues, it's the uh, um, earliest point of start of this mission. Because you have to wait until all the aspects have been researched that have been qualified by the demonstration. So, um, so the relay service perspective, um, the selling, unique selling propositions are the permanent coverage, the exclusive zone, and it's only one provider. You only have to play, place a satellite there and don't have to have the international lunar network. You have to place at different point, uh, point, points and um, have to have nodes over there. It's just one satellite covering everything. Then the long-term infra long infrastructure is for the stability. Um, it's attractive for agencies and even the private sector. If there will be a private company on the moon, they would perhaps buy it to this service or say, okay, we want to build our own satellite based on the platform I'm coming to. Compatibility is also a big thing. It's for the user market acceptance. They don't want to integrate some magical standard nobody uses, so EDS and ILN is important, and you can even connect and combine um, both networks via a bridge through the uh, Tyco Relay Satellite Service. And of course, standard and cost with regard to increased reliability. These things are proven or should be proven with high technology readiness level. And all of this is or could be a building block in space development exploration. Okay. Um, satellite platform for EML4 or EML mission in general. And we are qualifying the AOCS system and staying there for a long time. It could also be interesting for communication satellites in general because EDRS and TDRS system could also build their own ones based on the type of study. It's a service, so we can even place a lunar navigation satellite system service there, like mentioned before. So not only using the GPS signals, but only also systems from the other signals from the EML4 and EML5 points and increasing the coverage of the signal. And long time measurement, you can even use it for um, deep space technology, technology qualification and even space weather. So this is the first point some solar flares, flares are hitting and we have men on the moon, so if they have some more preparation in time to get into the bunker on the moon or something else like this. And in general science mission like space observatories and early warning system for Earth and Moon in general. So uh, other satellite missions based on type of architecture is also another selling point here. Hmm? I'm, I'm over here. Integration in lunar exploration joint initiative is essential. Like I said before, it's not clear which mission will be done after 2025. So there should be talks about do we want to have an additional servicing or do we want to do by ourselves? If there will be some kind of infrastructure needed by these 
partnering missions out to the moon. So they could consider taking the Tycho concept and uh, it's a multi-mission program. And there should be at least 10 missions serving through the 10 years, even more. So otherwise you don't get your motivation again. And uh, available for all missions. It doesn't matter if it's ESA and uh, NASA or whatever, or private ones, as long as we can do drawing. A dual start of TMA-1, it's operational, and the first new mission could be considered. So there is at least, at the starting point, there is some lunar mission we can cover. And it's a proposed integration in EUS and ILN, so it just makes sense to, into, to connect and have a redundancy line if you can't go directly to Earth again. So they are using its energies and connecting infrastructure, and of course, European heritage with EUS is still there. Collaboration, like I said before, is could be used for ESA, for but it's also a platform for TDRS, for NASA, so they could use this and it's open for everybody. And uh, it is a candidate for ESA and open for all, so you have to get the money back in. And it just enables certain missions like in the small exclusive zone where every other relay is not covering anymore. Okay. Um, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is venture a little way past them into the impossible. It's a quote from Monsieur Arthur C. Clark, I really like. And with this new concept, um, Tycho could be the first EML4 relay communication satellite. And I hope so. So, thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Super. Not my English, but this one's the first. Uh, thanks for the presentation, great work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering uh, what are the relative advantages of uh, the EML 4 point uh, compared to other Lagrange points, Earth Moon Lagrange points like the, the L4 point? They are a little more long, long time stable, you need less delta B. So it's um, from the um, it's a research by what uh, Folter and Born, um, they compared everything. Uh, yeah. And these are only for the data visa annual for uh, the EML4. For EML2, for example, it had been three times this delta V. And um, you have to have other AOCS strategies. You have to go in, in halo orbits. You are here, you are staying on the same plane. It's way more easier. Even though I couldn't uh, simulate it here, it's way more easier. So that does a, this, this is a big advantage to it. I have contacted all of them, and half of them gave me some um, remarks and even shared the data rates. Not all of them. The company is not. We need you. I hope. We need you. We speak later. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? I have one question. It has to do with the slide that you have up here. You say 27 meters per second in the station. Yeah. As you mentioned, we don't know very much. We haven't had any demonstration missions up there, so there has to be a little bit of uncertainty in those numbers. There is 100% of, no, normally I use 10 or 20 system margin or margin, and here is 100 in the delta V and the propellant mass. Okay, so, so you've actually, let's say, taken into consideration the, the light and the sizing of your satellite propulsion system, and you can see you have a high velocity uh, accuracy. Yeah, because it's the only uncertainty I couldn't um, yeah, solve for myself. And it was really, really hard, and I had to give up after two weeks of trying to do simulate it. But I wanted to finish my studies. So, very interesting topic. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah.